All right, so um, I hope you've enjoyed my mimicking capabilities. It looked quite real, didn't it? <laughs> it looked like I was speaking, but I wasn't. <laughs> Rahul and I had all this set up. Yeah. We thought we'd surprise you with something different today for this live stream. <laughs> well done, Rahul. Okay, so um, taking two steps back, my name is Mario. I wanted to thank Rahul for the opportunity. We were saying earlier, you guys couldn't hear us, but we were having fun. <laughs> that uh, it's always nice when uh, you know we've had a chance to work together and then yeah. we can continue that conversation in other means. So now officially and for the record with voice, we hope, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, so my name's Mario and uh, this is a little personal intro from my side. So I happen to be Portuguese because that's you know my, what my parents were. I was born in Mozambique. I lived in all these uh, strange places first as a kid and then as an adult, I thought I would continue the adventure. So, you know, went out across a few different places. Um, I've been in Asia for the last 12 years. My background is working on the client side for Unilever and Nokia for about 12 years, and then doing my own entrepreneurial ventures for the last 12 years. So that's a quick summary. And I'm going to tell you just a couple of words on what got me here today and how Rahul and I met, which was with Flying Fish Lab. And so Flying Fish Lab was head headquartered and founded in Singapore in 2016 with my co-founder, Joao Serre, and we're active across the globe. Uh, we focus on our controlled disruption methodology, which is what we're going to talk about here today. And this is about helping companies and businesses and brands deliver breakthrough solutions by combining these three lenses that we will talk about, outside in, cross-functional co-creation, and silo functional work. And our expertise lies in applying it to innovation and positioning challenges. So just one more slide, which you did see, but this one would sound <laughs> lots of cool logos. Yay for us. Now, uh, it's actually a, 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 we're, we're super proud of, of having a, a, a very, um, yeah. a very, you know, um, um, exciting group of, of clients to work with. So that's the last of our bragging slides, I'll park that to the side and I'll go back to what we're here for today. So thank yeah. you for raising the issue on sound. Um, I was asking earlier, how might we define innovation? Or I should have added the word breakthrough innovation. Yeah. If you set yourself up to try to do something that has never been done before, that is going to be extraordinarily hard. In the last 2000 years, hmm. across the globe, you know, we're coming on 8 billion, I think it is. Yeah. It's extraordinarily hard to do something that has never, ever been done before. If you remember when Steve Jobs died, there was a designer in Hong Kong who produced the Apple logo with his face, a silhouette. Yeah. A designer in Belgium had had the same exact idea and they hadn't spoken to each other. Yeah. So that's how hard it is to innovate. Yeah. So if you say, I want to do something that's never been done before, that's really hard to do. But if you define breakthrough innovation as something that's never been done in this context before, no. then the possibilities arise. Because perhaps what matters isn't that it's never been done ever, but that it's never been done in washing machines, yeah. or there's never been done in the finance industry. Yeah. So let me give you some pretty basic and pretty old examples just because I wanted to cut through all the generations. Green grocer, nothing new. But if I'm in a different category, in personal care and soaps, and I decide to apply that logic to my category, then actually I might be able to create something pretty innovative, as Lush did when they launched their products. Freshly made personal care products, freshly made soap that smell really gorgeous, that look really gorgeous. Yeah. So that can be innovative within the context of the category. And uh, another fun one that I like to tease about. You know, I had one of these back in the 90s. That shows how old I am. <laughs> it's a cyan, you know, personal agenda. Yeah. And it had a touch screen at the time. Mm. So there was nothing new about touch technology in electronic devices. But when someone one day finally decided to bring that into the mobile telephony category, yeah. that was revolutionary. No buttons. Yeah. That had defined the category for 20 years, and all of a sudden there was no buttons. So it's not that what Apple did in bringing touch to mobile phones was never been had never been done before. Yeah. It's that touch hadn't existed in this category before. So that's just a little bit of context because we want to kind of take you now on a on a different direction. 
Um, when you manage a brand, as I did for many years, and Rahul's been on the other side, on the agency side, we all like to think that my brand is different. Yeah. That's and and the agency, you know, <laughs> typically, you know, they beat our drum. Yeah. Yes, you know, we're different. <laughs> we're very different. So I'm going to take this example, which is just a stupid example that we picked off the internet anywhere and said, everyone drinks water. So we asked Rahul's girlfriend, the target audience, what she wanted for water. And she would say, it's about vitality, water is important to me. And I went to Rahul, my advertising guru, and he came up with this great poster. Hmm. Uh, I loved it. I took it to my research partner. They tested it with his girlfriend. His girlfriend said, yeah, that's, you know, that splash. It's pretty cool. It works all good. Yeah. Been there, done that. Not wrong. Yeah. The trouble is that, did I tell you I worked for Nestle or, or Danone? I can't remember because I moved jobs hmm. and you know, the trouble is that whoever is asking your girlfriend that question, they get the same answer. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if I happen to work for Danone or Nestle or Coca-Cola, what you need for water is the same. So we end up creating as brand owners, as agencies, we end up creating if we're only responding to what consumers tell us, what we'd like to call the category codes. And if we create those category codes and we simply play them back, then no matter the category, what we're doing is offering consumers this sea of sameness yeah. where they cannot tell one product apart from the other, one service apart from the other. And so it becomes incredibly difficult and consumers end up looking at price or you know any other variable because it's all looking very commoditized. Yeah. So the obvious question then becomes, all right, so how do we create breakthrough. And we like to use this image just as an analogy for what actually needs to be done in order to create breakthrough. If I asked you today, you know, what is this? You would say, Sumo. and I would ask, why? Why didn't you say chess? Yeah. I mean, you could have said race, yeah. you know, yeah. race card competition, yeah. but you said sumo. Yeah. You could have said they're blowing balloons or bubbles in the park, but you said sumo because we've learned that you know this chubby guy that's had too many noodles with the silly <laughs> outfit there's probably a circle on the floor and he's supposed to push his opponent out of that circle we've learned that over time we learn stuff we can't keep questioning every single time we stand in front of an aisle in the supermarket we can't question ourselves everything all the time so we learn the rules and these are the rules of sumo cool so far so good but if i happen to be the little guy I don't like that prospect mm. because the big guy is basically saying to me, all right, kid, you want to fight? And so sometimes we find ourselves in this situation as a brand or as a business, we're up against an opponent, an obstacle, and that opponent or obstacle could be a competitor or it could be market forces, a distributor that's not playing ball. It could be the regulatory environment that isn't you know, friendly. So it's not just a competitor. It's some obstacle that's in your way. And it seems as if there's only one way to do this, only one way to play this game, because you just said, this is sumo. This is what I've expected. Yeah. I expect a game of sumo. And if I fight, what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to be good for me. Yeah. So in order to create breakthrough, what we need to do is to reframe the challenge and ask, why does it have to be this way? They look like sumo players, but could they be, you know, engaged in a game of badminton? And Rahul's going to say, come on, that's a really <laughs> stupid idea because you can see they don't have yeah. you know, the equipment to play badminton. All right, Rahul. Mm -hmm. um, what about chess? Oh, not a stupid idea. They don't have a chess board. What about a race? And Rahul's going to go, well, yeah. maybe, maybe, because here I could challenge my opponent to a race mm -hmm. instead of a game of sumo. The reality doesn't change. I'm still facing a much bigger opponent. But all of a sudden, I have found a way to challenge my opponent in such a form that the expected outcome will be different. Yeah. And that's really what we're looking for. So reframing the problem in such a way that the expected outcome is different. And to go back to my Cyan and Apple example, I was at Nokia when Apple launched the iPhone. Nokia was the big guy. They had all of the manufacturing and supply chain capabilities that Apple would only ever dream of. But they took Nokia on the one thing that they weren't as good 
which was yeah. the experience, yeah. the user experience. So Nokia said, do you have the factories? And Apple replied, do you have the experience? Yeah. And guess who won? Yeah. Consumers chose. So just an example of how we need to reframe the issue. Now, in order to do that, we need something that we call intelligent naivety. So this intelligently naive perspective is what's going to help us to reframe the issue. And very often, it's most abundant to those that are outside, outside our environment, outside our company, outside our category, who don't think about you know, shoes or cars or insurance day in, day out. Yeah. So going into what's this got to do with control disruption? All right, control disruption is actually about a space. It's not a thing. When we overlay intelligent naivety onto the category expertise that exists within every single company, mm. if you're a popcorn maker, you know about popcorn. If you're a car manufacturer, you know about cars. If you're an airline, you know about transporting passengers. Mm -hmm. So you've got the category expertise. But someone who doesn't know your category like you can come in and say, hey, why don't you raise the big guy? Yeah. And there isn't a single answer. Just like we said, there could be badminton, there could be chess, there could be a race. Right. So control disruption can go from something as simple as changing a Pantone. If I said Coca-Cola is going to become green tomorrow, hmm. they would say that's disruptive. Rahul would say, come on, it's a Pantone change. Yeah. We could have a debate, but that could be disruptive to some people. On the other extreme, we could talk about Uber or Grab or Airbnb. Is that still a hotel group? Is it? Isn't it? We can have a debate. It's at the other end. But between a Pantone change and a business model change, there are infinite possibilities. Yeah. And what control disruption does is it helps you to surface those possibilities. And you choose what's right for your company, for your brand, for your category. Because the answer isn't the same for everyone. Yeah. Disruption for you is vanilla for me. And disruption for me is an acceptable risk for you. Right. So why should I try to impose the same solution on everybody? Now, how do you actually deliver control disruption for innovation? Um, this is based on the experience and the work that we've done that we're sharing this. And I'm going to take you through it in the next few slides. So we'll start by step by step. The beginning is we need to have a very strong starting point, powerful insights. Because actually, we need an understanding of what consumer tensions we might need to focus on. Or if there aren't any problems in the category, what opportunities to improve do we have? Essentially, we need some areas to focus on because otherwise, if we're trying to create something that's for everybody, it's a product or a solution that doesn't suit yeah. anybody. So we need to focus on what, are, what problem are we trying to solve? Trying to solve everything for everyone is a sure way to fail. So beginning with that clarity that will give us direction in terms of the work that we need to do. And we'll go with the first lens because this is really what is going to help us reframe the issue. So how do we lean into this intelligent naivety? We've just said that outsiders were better placed to help us see our blind spots. So how do we tap outsiders in a cost-effective and scalable way? There are many ways. In our experience, by far the best is something called creative crowdsourcing. You might not all be familiar with it, so we'll take you through it. So the first lens, we call it a lens because it's a way to relook at things, is this creative crowdsourcing. So what is creative crowdsourcing? Um, a lot of platforms, online platforms, have been established for many years that offer the service of talented individuals. These individuals are essentially looking for a creative challenge. They could be working at a, at a, a creative outlet, be it an agency, a studio, whatever, they could be a student. They could just be an accountant who's, you know, regretted not taking his arts diploma and, and you know, ended up doing a financial career instead. It doesn't matter. Typically, these platforms are very open to anybody 
who has interest in solving creative challenges. And typically, it works in a com competition format with a prize pool. So you'll say, hi, everyone. I'm Coca-Cola, and I'd like to come up with the next flavor for Coke Zero. What should we do? And everyone on the platform is going to submit an idea and typically visualize it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a number of platforms out there, different platforms, different pros and cons, costs, geographical focus, IPs, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to get into that. I just <clears> want to give you a point of view that creative crowdsourcing is a, a tool that's available through online platforms. And what you need to do to start with this lens is to understand the core of your creative challenge. So that problem that we spoke about earlier, how might we translate that into a creative challenge? Because if we want to ask an outsider to help us, we can't go, uh, hey, Rahul, um, you know, I have a marketing brief for a problem about the positioning of my... They don't understand any yeah. of that. They don't understand any of your marketing jargon. And that's not why they're in it. They're in it for the fun of using their creative muscle. So help me invent the next Coke Zero. Well, that sounds exciting. Yeah. Not, you know, coming up with the, a whole difficult to understand language about something I don't even get. Yeah. So what could be the heart of our creative challenge in terms of the problem, the innovation problem that we're trying to solve? Based on that, identify, you know, the best crowdsourcing platform, initiate and engage the crowd. Now here, typically these platforms will do this for you. The difference when we do stuff is that we'll manage that, but you know, to each his own. And then we get the crowdsourcing results. So the platform closes the competition and says, here's the output. So this is what we call the raw output. Now, to give you a sense, and we'll give you an example later on, these are some examples of the sorts of output that can come from such contests. The previous one was in headphones. This one is in laundry. And so there'll be some smaller, simpler sketches. There will be some more sophisticated ones. Mm -hmm all kinds of things, again, depending on the platform, depending on the crowd, depending on the individual. But once you've gotten that output, then what you need to do is to not take it at face value. Understand that this idea from this creative person needs to be analyzed with your category expertise, with your understanding of what are some of those pain points that you have where they have contributed with a potential new point of view. Okay. So they're going to suggest badminton or chess. And you're the one who has to know if that's available to you or not, yeah. if that makes sense or not. Don't blame them for not knowing that. They don't know the constraints. That's why yeah. we're asking them. Yeah. So our suggestion here would be to kind of decompose this into the different ingredients that you're looking for. So if it's an insight, if there's a benefit that you're looking for or an RTB, a reason to believe, not to, not to bring jargon into this, yeah. or ingredients, or maybe packaging formats. So then you should look at these separately because each of these components can be applied in your solution. Mm. It doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. Um, we can think of, a, of an old project where uh, in, a, in a femme care context, somebody suggested a bathtub cover, mm. which has got nothing to do with femme care. But the insight was around temperature. And that's what was interesting. So you can't just look on the surface of, of what people are suggesting. And this is for a proposition. So here, this is an ad set for how might we change what we're offering consumers as a benefit. And so we're looking at a different sort of value add versus yeah. a product. So whatever you get from the crowd, please consider that it has to be analyzed and filtered for where does this add value to what I'm trying to do. You can't just take it at face value. That's really, really important. Then once you've done that, you can go on to the next lens. You've always you know, heard people say that it's great to work cross-functionally, and that's true. So the thing here, though, is that we need to look at what's new. So at the cross-functional stage, what we're looking to do is to tackle our blind spots. So to what extent, ask yourselves, to what extent your experience, your depth of knowledge, your interest in the competition. You know, when I used to work in the industry, every brand plan started with a competitive scan. Right. But by doing that, I'm already digging myself into a frame of mind. Yeah. This is what the competition does. So it makes sense. Yeah. People are not stupid. This is how it's done. This doesn't work. 
every time I accept that, there's a pro and a con. The benefit is I move faster. I don't have to keep questioning everything. But the disadvantage is that the world changes. And what was true five years ago when I set that rule might not be true today. Yeah. And so the difficulty is that when you've been in an industry for five, 10, 20 years, you start taking stuff for granted and it's not always easy to challenge that. So just bringing together a cross-functional team into co-creation without any new data point is not going to help you to change things. You need some new piece of information. That's what the outside is going to do. It's going to enable us to challenge some of those internally held beliefs. Hey Rahul, why is the shirt blue? Well, no particular reason. Yeah. You know, why are hamburgers round? Uh, they have to be safe to eat. <laughs> that rule I can't challenge. Hmm. But they could be square, they could be yeah. triangular. Maybe there's a supply chain reason. I don't know. Yeah. But maybe there isn't. And so this is when the conversation can start to get interesting. And that's when it makes sense to bring all the functions around the table and to go, really? A square hamburger? Hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Let's explore that for a minute. And that's when you can get that conversation going. But you need that spark from the outside, that mm. element. So our recommendation in terms of how to run these sessions is don't try to get to the answer straight away. Please don't get into a room, pick up a piece of paper, and try to write down the answer to your challenge, to your problem, to your innovation issue. That is only going to limit you because you've got all that baggage. It takes time to unwind it. And consider that somebody comes from advertising, somebody comes from finance, somebody from supply chain. So we don't all have the same background. We've all got baggage, but it's different. Yeah. So perhaps you need to start with something that we'd suggest called an immersion. It's so maybe a little bit on, you know, tell me about what we're doing in terms of tech. How does the app work? What's the back end of the app? What do we need to know? Yeah. Or about the product or the functionality or the technology so that everyone has a baseline understanding. And then wrap it up with the crowdsourcing, because that is sure to fire up the discussion. It's going to have people going, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. And I think, Rahul, that's, that's you, know, the experience you, you experienced that, yeah. where, yeah. OK, you know, I get the tech. I understand you know, I'm working in shampoo, so of course I had an idea. It's cool that you told me now, yeah. but OK, so that's done. But actually, that I never considered this possibility. So this gets the energy going. and allows you to start questioning some of those things. And what we'd suggest you do next is to diverge as much as you can from it once you've started to get that momentum. Very often, we find situations where clients want to jump straight into the solution and say, great, all these crowdsourcing ideas. Yeah. So can we cluster them? No. Can we refine them? No. Hold fire. Yeah. Your brain doesn't switch as quickly as the buttons on your laptop. You can switch app, just, you know, control tab. It's a flick of a second. Your brain doesn't work like that. Yeah. So if you're starting to explore possibilities, continue to diverge until you say, stop, my head hurts. I can't think anymore. So our suggestion there in divergence is to look for stretch exercises, and we'll show you some, that will enable you to do some creative divergence. And then comes the time when you'll have to do some convergence. So typically, this would be a, you know, in the real world, face to face would be a, a one day session. In the digital world, it's a bit different. Yeah. But uh, at the end of one day, you'd probably have about four to 800 ideas in half a day, another half day for the immersion. And that would be how many people? That would depend. But typically, it would be cross functional. So you'd mm -hmm. want to have anybody who's involved in the delivery of whatever you're trying to create. Yeah. So whether it's legal, whether it's sales, whether it's you know key suppliers of ingredients or components or software or whatever that may be, mm -hmm. if they have a hand in the pie, bring them in at the beginning. Right. Regulatory. Don't wait two years. Yeah. You know, invite them now, so they don't they don't just say can't be done. Yeah. Okay. So what can I do? Yeah. That's the opportunity to then ask you know your your regulatory colleagues. So. After you've done all this, you've probably experienced some of these exercises. So here are just some examples of the things that we've used and that worked really well. Subdivergence exercises. For example, one that we like called hypertargeting. You know, what if you focused on a very peculiar niche? 
not because they're your mainstream clients, but because perhaps studying the needs of a very peculiar set of individuals might help you tap into a solution that has value for the whole population. Mm. So in this case, for example, we were working with a personal care brand that was targeting women. And that particular brand was about adding femininity to women. And so in looking for exercises to stretch, we, we thought of, okay, where do we have a target audience that is in the most need of adding femininity? Well, someone that comes from masculinity and wants to add femininity. Right. So what do these people need? What could we create for them? Yeah. Because if they have zero as a starting point, you know, we'll need to think harder. Yeah. Just doing the basics as everyone else in the category does isn't enough. Or to take financial services, it doesn't matter what the client was here, but the point is that people just don't care about this product. So when you don't care, what emotion do you feel? None? Yeah. Apathy? Yeah. So what if we choose to inject, to insert a new emotion into the category and go completely against what the category norms are? provocation. Mm. And this was very, very interesting. It doesn't mean that we're going to do this. It means that we're exploring the possibilities that arise yeah. from these exercises. To take a different category, this was for a, um, a European engineering-centric business, very male-skewed. You know, it's all about the functionalities and the engineering, uh, um, you know, uh, truth of the product. Yeah. And then we said, well, okay, that's your category. That's what you understand. What if we overlaid the rules and conventions of a completely different category? How might that create new possibilities? Mm. So, okay, let's think of ice cream. Ice cream? What's that got to do with our category? That's exactly the point. Why do people love ice cream? And in doing this exercise, what it helped these individuals, this team, see was that actually, whilst the technology needs to be there, there's no reason why we should leave out other dimensions. Yeah. So this helps us to see things we might have missed. Or for a last exercise, you know, imagining that you've suddenly been acquired by someone who doesn't know anything about your business, but has a very strong point of view, and how they would tackle your challenge so putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, trying to solve your challenge can be very liberating and very interesting at the same time because it will offer new possibilities that you don't feel free to explore, but which they would. And in doing so, we're opening up for more possibilities. So as we're preparing to converge, the typical sort of situation is this is a room, in this case, plastered with 900 ideas in this particular context. Uh, in the virtual, you know, post-COVID world. I'm sorry I had to defocus the images, but this was also about 800 post-its that were done virtually. Um, and so you've got a lot of output. Sometimes people get scared. How are we going to process all of this? Yeah. Remember what we said about crowdsourcing? Well, consider that because your team is a small crowd as well. Yeah. So what we're going to do next is to start converging. And so this convergence is about using a particular way to capture that proposition or that concept that we want to create verbally first, based on all of the input and stimuli that we've generated, and then transferring that to a visual. And the last step that you need to do is what appears to be a short listing. I'm going to say appears to be, mm. because it's not about the democratic process of choosing the, mm. the winners. Mm. Leave that to the stakeholders. But it is about saying, Rahul mm. voted for this idea, and I voted against it. Why did you vote for it? Because it's lightweight. Oh, it's aluminium. I thought it was metal. Oh, in that case, it's OK, then I like the idea. Yeah. So you're actually aligning by mm. enabling people to tease out those misunderstandings. So that's really the purpose of this shortlisting is to enable people to align. So typically a session like this would generate, again, in sort of a half day, plus the shortlisting and discussion, about 30 to 60 concepts. And that's what you saw. Right. Now, our suggestion is that this is still too many, and you would need to reduce this to a more manageable number to take forward. No one's going to launch 30 innovations. We know that. Yeah. 
And there's probably a lot of redundancy anyway, because he was thinking about the same idea that I was thinking. So you're going to have some duplicates, that's normal. But then you take your best, you say, okay, how do we take this forward? So this is just an illustration to show you that here in team three, what you have is some crowdsourcing output, some post-its from what we generated that got transferred into our template. And then from the templates, you know, we created our proposition, concept, solution, product, whatever you'd, you'd like to create. Okay. Now comes the third layers. We've had all this great energy inspired by the crowd. It's, it's all looking fantastic. But, yeah. you know, once the energy cools down, Rahul came to me and said, you know, Mario, I don't think that's going to work. Why? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I know the market in India or I know the market in Malaysia. I just know that there's not going to yeah. Why didn't you say something? Well, you know, everyone liked it. I didn't want to rain on the parade. So, so, so this is the time when we need to actually Hmm. It's like you've just bought a house, you've got a cooling off period. Hmm. Can I afford it? Do I have the route to market? Yeah. Do I have the sales team to push this? Uh, do I have the technology? Do I have the suppliers? Do I know which doors I need to knock on? You know, what's the expected profitability for this yeah. solution for this product? So we have that expertise that exists within the business. Why not leverage that before you go out and spend money? Hmm you know, testing and doing things. Just take a little moment to, to look at that, consider that. And so what, what you need to do at this stage is to prepare. So if you're, if you're running this process, you need to prepare a briefing for each of the functions hmm. and ask your advertising partner, ask your supply chain partner, ask your finance partner, ask your sales partner, your marketing team to think through the implications of that proposition of that product of that app of whatever we've just created does it make sense for you what do you think could go wrong what should we do so what we want at this point is a yes if not a oh you know it can't be done because we don't have a factory for it yeah uh, that's not a valid answer yeah it can be done if we set up a new factory in jakarta hmm. oh gosh okay that's that's not exactly but I know what it takes. It might not be palatable. It might not be what I want, but I know what it takes. Then we can make a decision, a management decision, on whether that makes sense or not. But at least we know the conditions required for that offering to succeed in your particular function. Right. So the logical thing after a few weeks of thinking through this is to bring back the team and to share that. And so basically you have a part where you need to download and say, me from finance, what I think is this. Raul's going to say, well, me from advert from a comms perspective, what I think is this. And everyone chips in. There's going to be some alignment. There's going to be some misalignments. Yeah. And so you then have to discuss when things don't add up. And it might be that you modify that solution. It might be that you change it in some other way. Or, you know what, if this team doesn't believe it can be done, then just kill it. There's no point taking it forward. Yeah. So at the end, you need to build a plan which has the actions that everyone will take. And that's really the final deliverable. Oh. But because we've all built it together, we've been in it through the beginning. So what you have is a sense of ownership that every team member is committing to because they were part of a painful process sometimes, you know, of figuring yeah. out stuff and you've done it together. So once you put that plan together and we say, Mario's going to do this, Rahul's going to do that, you know, the finance guy's going to do that, the sales guy's going to do this. There is a sense of commitment and a common understanding of what we're trying to do. So the likelihood of success is far greater. So this is, in a nutshell, control disruption for innovation. At this point, I'm just going to pause and ask Rahul and I guess the audience as well if you've got any questions. Yeah, so while we wait for questions, um, okay, so I don't have any specific questions right now. I'm very keen to see the, you know, the process in action. So maybe, you know, if you want we have to, a, we have a, a case study. Yeah. If you want to share the case first and then maybe we'll discuss okay. more after that. Let's do that. Yeah. So, um, as you'll understand, the case has been, uh, as, as one would call it sanitized, yeah. <laughs> um, just because it's obviously um, you know sensitive to share the work that we do. Uh, so so what we'll share with you is 
all things that have been um, you know, unbranded. So uh, it's, it's going to be a case from the dairy industry, but uh, you know, good luck guessing who it is because we've, we've anonymized. So the, the challenge, um, relatively simple, just to, to keep the example quite, uh, quite, quite vanilla or, or uh, vanilla in this case, actually quite suitable for dairy. <laughs> um, you know, the company was looking to build an innovation pipeline in a particular space of dairy for specific markets, Southeast Asia and China, across four opportunity areas for two of their top brands. The additional challenge that this brief had was that the timeline was very short and the budget was limited. So you'd need to know which partners to work with in terms of crowdsourcing that would make the project viable in terms of costing. So the journey is very much what I've described earlier. So you set up, um, you know, this is a language that we use called preconditions for success. So do we have everything in place to run the race? Uh, that's just a setup stage. And then the three lenses, outside in, cross-function, and in this case, an accelerated silo because the client didn't have the luxury of time. So we did a, a summary, a fast version of that extensive exercise. So starting with the first lens, um, over the course of three weeks, this platform generated 53 entries. Now, from a project budget perspective, as I said, they had a limited budget. So this was a more uh, cheap and cheerful, as we like to call it. Yeah. So you'll see that the quality of the entries isn't so good, but it's good enough to stimulate the discussion. And that's the main point. It's yeah. not necessarily about you know some fantastic drawings. So what I'm going to show you next is the what, what the analysis looked like. So here, there's a central challenge, and there were certain territories or inside territories identified by the client. So what we did is we, for the creators, instead of giving them the marketing jargon, we translated these areas into individuals. So there was a person called Kathy, mm -hmm. and she was the representation of one particular inside area, and right. Yasmin and Ravi. And so each of these represented, we didn't tell them that, but each of these represented one of these inside areas. Right. So when looking at the ideas, and I'm showing you an example, um, basically what we then did is to tell the team which of the areas did it kind of tick the box on. So this was the Kathy area or the Yasmin or Ravi. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to flick through to give you a sense of these. On the left, we've got the original visuals designed by the creators from the platform. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, the work that we did looking at, okay, what's the underlying insight behind this idea? What's the benefit? What are some of the reasons to believe that we can find in the explanation? Format, because that was relevant for the client, yeah. and the ingredients. Again, this was something that the client was looking for. You know, we need some inspiration for new ingredients. So the intention isn't to take you through a debrief in detail, but just to give you a sense of the variety yeah. and the richness of output. So this is a hand-drawn scheme. Yeah. But again, it's, it's defined enough for us to see that this is what the idea is, and this is how it works. That's really what's relevant for us here. So there are some better ones. And, you know, looking at formats, this is a capsule that mixes together. This is a fun tube that contains a reservoir of natural flavored juice you squeeze into. Uh, this is a goodness machine. So you can see that it goes in any possible direction within the space of the brief. It doesn't go wild. This is something that you dilute into water, so you can mix it into cold water. Or you can see where the inspiration came from here, yeah. you know, bubble yogurt. Um, you know, some more basic ideas that they've just stolen from other categories. Um, you can see that, you know, all the way to desserts, there's mm -hmm. a huge variety, and that's exactly what the crowdsourcing needs to do, mm -hmm. to stimulate, to inspire, to expand our horizon. So then the second lens, the co-creation. Here, as I described earlier, you start by the immersion. So you can see there are some of the mood boards that the team had prepared, mm. and this is of their own initiative. So sharing some of that pre-work, sharing some of the consumer insights, and finishing with the crowdsourcing ideas. Mm. Some of the exercises that we did here, um, an exercise called Takeover, imagining that you've been bought by a company that puts customer experience at the heart of everything they do. Mm. How does that change what you do in yogurt? Mm. or overlaying the rules of a different category, haute couture, going to the extremes that haute couture goes. Mm. How do we apply that to yogurt? Or another exercise, looking at affordability, an exercise called hyper-targeting, looking at tribesmen. So mm. if you have to sell this you know, to the 
to the smallest village in Sarawak in Borneo, Malaysia, hmm. and, and I'm sure you can have a, a, a parallel for you know so many other countries. Yeah. Um, how? What would you offer them? How would you do it? And these are just exploring possibilities. Again, we're diverging. We're not trying to nail down the solution. So you've started with the crowdsourcing. You can see that, and then some exercises. And so this was a uh, Rahul was saying earlier. This looked like our our, <laughs> our, our uh, room in Jakarta. Actually, this is in KL. Mm. Um, so in half a day, this team of about twelve to fourteen people—I can't remember exactly now—generated five hundred seventy ideas. <laughs> so this is their output, their ideas. This isn't done by us. This is their output. So taking all of that and the crowds, you can see here in that in that wall where you've got all those white things, that's all of the crowdsourcing ideas. So taking all of that stimuli, all of that input, and now combining it. So these two ideas in the crowd, plus this post-it and this post-it and this post-it, I'm going to create this solution. Right. That is where the value lies in this cross-functional work. That's when the convergence really you know, starts to pay off. And here, in this case, over the course of uh, about a day, we generated 38 concepts. So again, just to, to bring this to life. Mm -hmm. And what do they look like? You've got a little bit of a template on the left and the visual articulation on the right. Again, it's been sanitized and branded, but it just gives you a sense of what this looks like. So there's a verbal explanation, which is how you start, mm -hmm. but then you take it to an illustrator and you have to describe it and they will you know, do a first prototype, a visual mm. prototype of what this looks like. So then we go into a short listing. And what you can see here is people voting on the wall. These are all of the concepts that were created by the team. Mm. And they're voting for and they're voting against to see where do we have contradiction within the team in the understanding of what's going to be done. Then the third day, because we couldn't do a, a proper silo, we did an accelerated silo. So the functional feedback, where you basically, what we did here is set up an expert at a desk. Okay. So you've got R&D here, this lady in, uh, in white. You've got Steve, who was actually uh, in a different geographical location. So you had to contact your supply chain colleague <laughs> over the phone and say, hey, Steve, yeah. uh, how do you think this concept would work from a supply chain perspective? And he gave you the feedback. Yeah. You had the supplier who was here yeah. in the picture, the two gentlemen. So the team elected the representatives for the winning or shortlisted concepts and took them around each of the functions to say, okay, so Rahul, from a comms perspective, what do you think, you know, what are the main issues we can identify? Right. So the trade-off in this sort of accelerated silo is that you're not going to get the depth of having the time to, you know, discuss with your team to think it through, yeah. but you will get the most obvious hurdles. Those right. will surface right. because the next day, once you ask people to think about the obstacles, we're great about thinking why yeah. things won't work. Yeah. We love to shoot it down. So yeah. that's super easy for us to do. Yeah. So the main obstacles typically come out. So at the end of this session, and at the end of this project, just to give you a sense, this was five weeks start to finish. Hmm. It was a three-day session face-to-face -face, back in the old days. Um, you know, 53 crowdsourced ideas, 570 from the team, down to 38 concepts, 10 that were taken forward. Nice. And all of these 10 post-control disruption achieved top scores in consumer testing and have led to launches across multiple markets. And I, I can't go into that because otherwise, you know, two and two is four. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, we'd love to, to share some more. That's it. So this is just to try to bring it to life a bit more. Um, and just a, a little uh, add-on to that. Um, you know, when you ask people pre-control disruption, you know, is your pipeline going to help us gain significant thought leadership? Yeah. And post-control disruption, this is the shift that you see in the team. Yeah. So I thought I just added this slide to give you a sense that yeah. it, in, in, in my eyes, it works primarily because, you know, your team gets to do the work and they actually have all of the ownership. Right. And I think it's a, it's a way to facilitate that. It's a way to enable that to yeah. kind of surface. But essentially, the merit and the value lies with the team. It is ultimately your work and this is what you're seeing the chart is people then see and believe that actually what we've created can really make a difference so that's it <laughs> any questions yes so we'll wait while we uh, you know get questions from the viewers in the meantime i wanted to discuss a couple of things okay so finally we are back to the screen <laughs> so um, so when we worked together that was a 
you know, a physical product that you were trying yeah. to work towards the innovation for. Um, my question is that, you know, in, in today's times when there are so many of digital innovations happening yeah. and a lot of digital new products which keep on developing and there's like that rapid prototyping process that happens. So how well does this same process apply when you want to innovate, uh, when you're thinking of innovations on the digital product side? Very good question. We've just done um, a D2C offering mm -hmm. for uh, actually a different dairy company. <laughs> mm. It's an interesting question. Mm. Um, so basically, let me try and answer differently. The principles are the same. What you're going to focus on is going to be features mm. as opposed to product attributes. Mm. But the principles stay the same. So you can still crowdsource a UX, you can crowdsource features mm. and attributes. Uh, it's going to be different platforms. Mm. So not all the platforms can do everything. This is where you need to have a little bit of, of knowledge of the industry. And mm. I guess our background in, in, in that industry helps as well. Yeah. Um, but going to the right platforms, getting the right stimuli, and then setting up with a team Mm. We've we've literally just you know just done that a month ago. That's why I'm, I'm referring mm. to that. Mm. Where what we're looking at is defining that whole journey, and so what should the offering be, and and putting that together. So the thinking still applies. The framework and the the lens through which you're looking at what you're creating is slightly different, mm. because one is a an app or a service versus mm. a product. Mm. Uh, and and uh, do you typically encounter situations where you know, the clients are probably involving you for a part of the entire process, but not the entire process. Yes, yes, because some clients will say, we'll do the silo ourselves. Hmm. We feel very confident this is our area of comfort, hmm. so we'll do the silo. Um, more seldom, uh, it can also happen to people come to us and say, we just need your help with the crowdsourcing. Hmm. Uh, but typically the first two lenses are, are in every project. Hmm. So I think in the last five years, we've had probably a handful that were just the crowdsourcing. Mm. Uh, maybe, I don't know, six, five or six or something like that. It would have been just a handful of them. Mm. The vast majority have the first two lenses, so outside in and cross-functional. Mm. And then I'd say about 70% have silo, but, mm. you know, mm. they might not allow it. So, so that brings me to, you know, you know, I have personally experienced the entire process and like I can vouch for it how how amazing the output comes from this. But the the question that has been playing on my mind is that say for example if you're a small business mm -hmm. and or say for example you're a startup and you're still in the early days where you're still fine tuning your product right and the principles can be applied I'm assuming they mm -hmm. can yeah. be applied even in their context right uh, but if they were to run it, mm -hmm. and if they probably didn't have the luxury or the budgets to hire you, mm -hmm. um, then what's the lesson that they can take away from this? Because the last thing they should probably do, in my understanding, is like, you know, the two founders with their other two colleagues, they sit in a room and try and run the process themselves. I don't think that will lead to the kind of quality that this whole process delivers. So what would be your advice to? So so, so first first on that, yeah. especially if it's at the very beginning, hmm. you're probably iterating. Yeah. So there's a lot of iteration and, and testing and building and improving. So you're probably less definitive in that roadmap versus what I've shown you. If it's a big corporation, you might not be able to change that every week. Yeah. You know? And if you're a startup, you can probably change that. You know, after, after two days, you can decide to, to change it, or even yeah. half an hour if the, if the, you know, uh, if if version three point five didn't do it, you know, three point six can be improved in half an hour. But so first, consider that it's probably more iterative, and therefore you can afford to have more, let's say, call it margin of error. So it, it's a bit more right. more flexible. Um, but to answer your question in a different way, we've had um, university students apply this to their projects. Hmm. So ultimately, the, the principle is, how do you make sure that you can ask someone who's uncontaminated with your view of the world hmm. for input? Hmm. That's what the outside in is. That's what the crowdsourcing is. So no matter how big or small, hmm. um, you know, hmm. ask a few people who don't 
live and breathe your product, your category, your business. Right. And start there. Right. Um, and the second point to what I said, when you when you come together with your team hmm. to try to crack it, don't try to get straight to the answer. I exactly. said that earlier, which is right. give yourself the chance to first explore possibilities. You see, the problem is that we're taught in a very linear, vertical way in, in our education model. Correct. One and one is two. Two and two is four. Correct. Uh, what's the answer to the best place to this table? There isn't one. Yeah. There, there probably no. I don't know how many times we can combine this this yeah. furniture in this room. Yeah. But there are 10, 20, 30, 40 answers. Right. So if you look at your business problem that way as a startup, there isn't probably just one answer to your to what you're trying to do. So before you try to narrow down to the answer, make sure that you've got enough divergence built in. Right. So allocate someone in the team who will make sure that, you know, at least for half a day, you will do nothing but explore other options. Mm. Okay, great. Another option. Great. Another option. So you go, stop. I yeah. can't take it anymore. Yeah. Okay, good. Now let's bring it back. Mm. And so it's very simple from that point of view. Mm. Um, it's great if you've got the luxury of having someone come in and run it for you. Mm. But if you're a small team, then what you can do is just, you know, allocate that role to someone mm. to make sure you make sure that we stay on track mm. and we're not going to jump the gun and go straight to the solution, you know, after half an hour sitting together. Yeah. Um, and the silo is actually the most natural part, to be honest, okay. which is to, that's that's when, you know, our expertise kicks in. Yeah. You know, you know about your industry, I know, and your discipline, whatever yeah. that be, that's actually the easiest bit. The thing that I think is important to understand is that you shouldn't try to create from a functional expertise perspective, not when you're when you're trying to innovate beyond what, just the tech can do for you. Right. So, so, so this is the bit. You, the technology will go. Will take you from two megapixels to four. From, yeah. You know, four users online at the same time to eight users online. But that's the path that Nokia took with with their phones. It's it's a linear engineering progression path. Correct. If you want to leapfrog, or if you want to find an alternative solution to that, you have to think creatively, no. not not engineering first so your, your creative mind needs to exercise first your engineering mind comes for the execution okay. it's a great idea how do i execute it yeah. you need the engineering mm. but but your creative problem solving mind which engineers are usually great at yeah but you're you know that that is the mind that needs to be driving mm. the the opportunity identification as opposed to yes i can do 16 megapixel now i can go to 20 that is going to be incremental. That's never Correct. going to be, you know, yeah. uh, dramatically different. Awesome. Thank you. So, so the question, uh, the other question, which has still been playing in my head, which I really wanted to ask you, is that uh, you know you've worked on both the sides. You've worked on the client side. You've worked, uh, you know, you started your own firm, and now you're doing great. So, so the thing is that we all know that most innovations fail, right? And I don't know what your personal experience was when you were working on the brand side, right? But um, when I experienced the process with you, it was very hard to think that these innovations would never see the light of the day or they would completely fail uh, the output, the way the output came out. But uh, why do you think that is the case? Because majority of innovations that come out from, and and pretty much anyone on the brand team, marketing team, has this constant ongoing job, which, you know, that's like a parallel job, which they are doing at the same time. So they are managing their existing brands, but there's a parallel job where you're trying to come up with their innovation pipeline. So so why do you think that, that is the case? That, that's a massive question. <laughs> that's like a super heavy question. Let's start there. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, how do I answer this? You first need to make sure that you're judging the right thing. You've got great innovation that doesn't work because it's not supported well. Yeah. So the product, the service, the app, the solution that you've created is fantastic, but we did a crap job of actually implementing it. We didn't put enough marketing money behind it. Right. We didn't put it in the right channels. We didn't launch it at the right time of the year. There's We didn't price it correctly. Yeah. There are so many mistakes that are 
that happened when you, okay, I've got it. Yeah. Now, how do I, you know, put it out there, the commercialization, the marketing of it? Yeah. There's so many mistakes that happened there. Right. Uh, that's, that's, you know, at, at the, at the end level going upstream, um, too often we find that clients are kind of locked in a particular way of looking at the world. Hmm. And there is, there is a combination of this is how we see the world with a lot of incremental innovation, which is not really, you know, innovation with a big eye, if I, if I want to mm. put it this way. It's not, mm. it's not very innovative. It's a variant. It's an incremental step. Mm. Not, not to, you know, not to put that down. That's still a way to create something new, but you expect consumers to get excited for another flavor of yogurt when there's already 647 flavors and yeah. you know you wanted to sell 20% of the category. Yeah. Someone is expecting the wrong things from, you know, you expect a goldfish to take over the ocean. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. Even if the goldfish is perfect and it's a gorgeous goldfish, but it's too small for what you're trying to do. And right. you know, if, if you want, then you have to invent something different, maybe a flying fish, but you know, the goldfish mm -hmm. is not going to do it. Yeah. Um, so, so there, there's actually a number of reasons, um, not to mention then the others that are outside your control, like timing, or you know, you might have launched. There's, there's a number of examples of people launching stuff that was too early, and yeah. so there's also, especially when it comes to technology, less in, in foods or consumer goods. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a number of factors. Um, whilst not, now, having said that, whilst there is no sure proof, you know, way for you to ensure that your your innovation will always work. I guess what, what many of the multinationals we work with try to do is they try to approach it by following a process. The irony is that sometimes they don't respect the process themselves. Yeah. But if you do, and if you follow these relatively, um, how should I say, relatively common sense steps, yeah. um, you've got a, a, a more likely than not uh, um, you know, probability of having success. The thing is that what we also see happening is that with the increasing pressure to go faster, with less resources, more agile, etc., we're trying to do more in less time. But the trade-off is that that increases our likelihoods of making mistakes or cutting corners too much. Yeah. And so at some point, that's kind of you know hurting you right. in terms of your initial objective to be successful with your innovation. Yeah. Because you're trying to do that and you're trying to do it the right way, but now you've given yourself two weeks instead of the four weeks you usually take. And so yeah. that is not helping you to then come out with something that has the robustness yeah. in terms of quality, thought through, et cetera, that you would, you would otherwise have. So that's a little bit the, the trade-off and the tension that needs to be managed. Mm. We can't get everything we want. Maybe we're putting too much pressure. So maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. You know, it's yeah. not gonna take, we can't afford to take you know, as long as we did 10 years ago to, to bring a new product to market. We need to keep feeding you know, the core of our brand with some new offerings that maintain the excitement in the category, right. especially more commoditized. But to be honest, today, you know, if you launch an app, isn't that another commodity? I mean, yeah. you know, if you launch a new service offering, there's plenty of stuff out there. So yeah. again, I think the challenge is if you're doing you know, uh, business analytics, then what is it that you can do that's different in your industry versus what everyone else is doing? Yeah. Maybe it's been done in rental cars, you know, but it hasn't been done in, in analytics. Right. So I, I think that's part of what we're suggesting here is to think that you know, just coming up with something that's new, never been done before is really, really hard. It's going to make it easier for you if you think of what could I bring to my category? What might be relevant in my context? Right. That somebody else has figured else is figured out elsewhere, right. and maybe there's something interesting that I could, hmm. therefore, create a new offering hmm. by bringing that new dimension into my category. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, so I think we've we are ahead. really overshooting on time. So let's take a couple of quick questions from the audience. Um, how was the crowdsourcing done? I think you already spoke about you know, how you go about crowdsourcing. Yeah. So let's look at the next question. Great presentation, Mario. What is the sweet spot for choosing the right information from around, among all crowd inputs? You want to... uh, I'm not sure there's a sweet spot because mm -hmm. it depends on what your constraint is. Mm -hmm. So if your constraint is time, mm -hmm. then speed is going to be of the essence versus the other parameters. If your constraint is cost, same thing goes here. 
Um, if you don't have any constraints, uh, or that's a bit of a big statement, but if yeah. you're if you're not extremely constrained by you know you've got enough time, you've got enough budget, etc., um, then I guess the other consideration is about uh, geographical coverage, uh, IPs, ways of working. Hmm. Um, there are many platforms out there. I guess in our experience, the ones that work the best are the ones that treat creators you know, the way you'd like to be created. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Right. Uh, treat creators decently. Mm -hmm. That means that some platforms actually pay you per idea, and then there's a prize pool. Mm -hmm. And those, in my view, tend to deliver better quality output than the ones that just do a normal competition format. That's mm -hmm. been around for many, many years, yeah. and that's the foundation of crowdsourcing. Yeah. Um, so if you can choose something better, you're likely to get a more thought through output. Mm. And that means that the stimuli is going to fit better with your need. So mm. therefore, it's going to allow you to move forward faster. Awesome. Yeah? I think we can take one more question. Um, we have next question. How do we ensure that the output from the crowd would be on brief? Oh, there we go. Because it could go really <laughs> wild and off. Or is that what you actually I, want I, to happen? I, it, it, so, you know, you, you would understand that coming from comms is that a good brief has enough constraint and well, enough freedom. Enough freedom. Yeah. So actually the hard part is writing a good brief. Mm. And if you write a good brief, then typically, as long as there's good enough community management, right. which most platforms tend to have, yeah. then they don't stray too far. If the brief is well written, if you tell them what's completely off brief, if you tell them what you're looking for, and you inspire them in the right way, you can do that. Um, I guess the challenge is, that's why I said at the beginning, you know, understanding yeah. what is the create the creative challenge that you can offer these individuals. Right. So I've got a business problem in you know gaming apps or in in airlines or whatever, but the the, the guy or girl in the platform doesn't really care about your business problem. Yeah. They're interested in, oh, that's a really cool challenge. I want to work on that. Yeah. So, so that's at the heart of, you know, driving the, the, the output to be centered around something that isn't completely crazy. And, you know, to, to touch on it again, the community management, that's critical. You need to have good community management uh, from those platforms. Awesome. I think we've overshot in a big way, but I think that's fine. People are enjoying the presentation. So uh, first of all, apologies for that little bit of audio glitch in the beginning, but I think nobody missed out the meat that was shared, so that's good. And uh, thanks a ton for Thank making, you. making time and coming over. And uh, to anyone who missed out in the beginning, Basically, I was asking you to subscribe to my YouTube channel or to follow my LinkedIn page. That's probably the most important information in the beginning. So if you haven't done so, you should do that so that you can stay updated with all future events. And thank you so much for taking out time on a Friday afternoon, evening, morning, depending on where you are uh, watching this from. So on that note, let's uh, call it a day. Thank you. Thanks a ton. Thanks thank a you. lot.